that this conference has been in place. And Sue was sharing with me history of last, how many inches of snow? Six? Six, six yeah. The keynote she shared was uh, a, a woman a little bit shorter than me in darkness here. Nothing could work, and she's standing on the table yelling out all the excitement that the conference is going to be giving. So I'm not standing on the table, but I'm standing in front of you. But this all should be turned toward you. This is not about at the state level. This is about you learning to take back. I want to give a shout out to the agency at this point. We are in an eight-month relationship, so still kind of new. And I'm very honored and pleased to say that the agency is fabulous. It is the gold standard when it governs data, when it collects it, when it uh, presses it forward for new and great ideas. So if I could have individuals, because I'm looking out here at these wonderful faces, they're from all over the agency. And that's one of the things that I'd like to do, is to make sure that we're not siloed up. The data that is collected here should be helping all parts of public school. In our nutrition program, in our licensing program, in all the special programs that we have. So if I could have all the people from OPI please stand. We're making sure that that precious piece of student data can go forward in multiple avenues. And I'm very excited to be at the helm of that. I also see that we have, uh, from all over the state, I've got a table from Missoula. Correct? Excellent. Excellent. We have Great Falls. Correct? Excellent. So if you could give me a shout out back here, who do I have? Which part of the state? Kyle, I'm from Pennsylvania. Okay, Pennsylvania's good. <laughs> uh, that's in the eastern part of our state, for sure. For sure. Where else in Montana do we have? Over here. Thank you. Thank you for traveling south. Appreciate that. Thank you. Over there. Where have we got? Back corner. Miles City. Miles City. That's eastern Montana. Thank you very much. Anywhere else? Give me a shout out, please. Cold Strip. Cold Strip. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Where else? Haver. Haver. Thank you. Good job. Anywhere else? Billings. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, we graduated from high school together, didn't we? Yeah, shout out, Wes and I go Bears. Yeah, for sure. Good to see you, Susan. Where else? Bozeman. Bozeman. Thank you. Excellent. Anywhere else? Wow. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Anywhere else? Montana Proud, that's what this is about. Hardman. Hardman, okay, there we go. My grandparents were Baptist missionaries down at Crow for 62 years. So my mother went to Hardin High. Yeah, so we have some, I think in Montana you can go anywhere and you can meet someone that you have some longevity with or a family member does. It is about Montana Proud. And Dad, uh, of course, collecting it, governing it, and then using it. And that's what this conference is about, is making sure that the integrity of how we use data continues and it's given back to schools. This is not about collecting data from the top. This is about collecting data from the bottom and then giving it back. The most important thing is giving it back. With everything that has occurred, Columbia Falls, you all know what happened in Columbia Falls? how we have the hackers in and everything else. That's scary. It is very, very scary. But it's going to happen. When I was in the legislature, I was only in my second term, so they didn't really know much about me. This is 2007. I had a death threat. My life, though, was only worth $50,000. <laughs> and I had a detail on me for about four days to protect me. I tell you, in high heels, I could run faster than them. But what was scary is it came in from Russia. Same thing, came in through Idaho and then into Montana. And they targeted women professionals. So that was me. Stayed married through it, but I did increase my value to my husband of $50,000. So it is about making sure that we govern carefully. I think that's very important. I mentioned Montana Proud when I gave a shout out to all those from the communities that have come across 
the state to here to travel safely here and going back safely. Montana Proud is about making sure that it is putting students first, collecting that important data, but using it is the heart. It is about the student. It's about, I'm just going to share really quick and then we'll get into the introduction of our, of our honored guest. It's about Montana Hope. How many here from Montana participated in the uh, walk, the NAMI walk? NAMI means about professional health and mental health, making sure that our students are good about who they are. And yes, that is something that parents, first and foremost, and schools, community, and of course our state. So Montana Hope is our number one thing, making sure that students feel good about who they are. That reflection back, even in middle school. We can all close our eyes and say, gosh, middle school, what a challenge. That's what we're emphasizing here. The other thing that we have is Montana Teach. How many here have an education degree? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. I've always said that teachers have a paper plate. They go through and they come back from a conference or Heaven forbid the school administrator comes back from a conference and says, gosh, this is what we need to do now. And we need to do it by this amount of time. And there's still stuff on that teacher's plate. And it just gets kept piling higher and higher. And it's challenging. I taught for 23 years. My dad was an American history teacher. My mother was a special ed teacher. I listened to it at the kitchen table. It is about teachers. Then it's about Montana Learn. Because you've got to have hope, you've got to have that great, fabulous teacher, and then you've got to have learning, which is where that data is coming from. It is about math. You're all in it for math, right? It is about numbers. But it's not just about a number in one day in a student's life. That's important. That test data is important. But it's about that entire school year. My husband said to me, he said, gosh, honey, you know, you're so worried about that first day of school. 179 after that. Every single one of those days needs to have that passion of that first day. And I think that's something that we can all take back. Every day is challenging, but every day is hope. It's about that teacher, and it's about learning, and then it all, it all rolls together in that great investment in education, those precious tax dollars. And it's about Montana Ready. Montana Ready means that we are readying, readying Montana and the United States and the world for those precious minds that are within our grasp in public school, in our communities. But what's next? It's not just about crossing that stage. It's what's next after that. And we want to give them the skills for wherever they are in life, wherever they are in Montana, to be able to be ready. Go to that employer and say, I got this. I'm valued. I'm valued as a person. I reflect who I am. I've had great teachers. I've had great experience in the classroom of learning. And now I'm ready. I'm ready for my next step in life. And I'm excited about Montana Ready. So those are the four things that you can take anything away from who else he is. It's hope. It's about that great teacher. Could be a teacher in the classroom. Could be a teacher in the hallway, could be that leader that's in that building, the leader that's in the district. It's about learning. And then it's about ready. Those are the four things there. Okay, so a little bit about that. Now let's get on to why you're here. Most important, what does the agency do? And Sue, I want to appreciate you putting this together, but I need bigger font next time. <laughs> You know, this is an eighth month relationship and a lot of things have been building prior to me even getting here. And I'm going to shout those out at this point. So, we have had a lot of partnerships. And I need to share that the data that is collected, we have uh, the Department uh, of Education at MSU has uh, been awarding many grants to the faculty. And some of these projects are a study on dual enrollment and post-secondary outcomes. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Carrie Myers and Scott Myers.
numbers on that. And then our longitudinal data system, which is GEMS, uh, is being used by teachers and administrators. And what is it that we can do better to meet their needs? And that is a study that uh, uh, Dr. Tina Verslin is, is managing at this point. In addition, MSU Department of Education faculty and graduate students are identifying schools with high scores in the writing subscale of the Smarter Balance Assessment. That's that one snapshot picture in time. And that needs to be a shout out for further work with Dr. Jane Downey and Heather Fisher. MSU's Department of Economics, I have a degree in economics I choose to teach, but a shout out to economics, is being used in our e-transcript data to identify courses related to financial literacy in high schools. With this data, they plan to research the level of student loan activity based on our financial literacy. And this is under the embrace of Dr. Chris Stoddard and Dr. Curly, Carly Urban. So that's MSU. That's where I got my education degree. Let's do a shout out to Go Cats. OK, here we go. And then we do a shout out to Go Grizz. Go Grizz. Came from. Uh, so at the uh, College of Education at the University of Montana, um, we have graduate students and education faculty that are engaged in comparing district specific assessments to statewide assessment results to try to determine how these local assessment tests prepare and assist student performance. And that's under the care of Dr. Trent Atkins. Internally, then, here at OPI, the OPI is assessing the efficacy of our 21st century after school program on student outcomes using our GEMS data system. The State Department of Labor is creating a link with labor data uh, to do analysis on P20, and we're excited about the possibilities of reaching out to workforce data and know that this is the vital step, and it's a first step in this area, and that's about Montana Ready, creating a workforce is going to take care of our future as well as preparing the future for new students and our youth. And then MBI. Y'all know what MBI is? Raise your hand if you do. Excellent. Spending multiple years here uh, housed within the agency. And that's the Montana Behavioral Institute initiative, excuse me. It's now comparing the data from the MBI tiered fidelity inventory to other GEMS data. The Montana Digital Academy is assessing the impact of its programs on other e-transcripts and GEM outcomes. And we have lots of other uh, various uh, work that's being done within MSU and U of M and of course Carroll College, as well as with the College of Deans who are working together uh, for instructional support in our teacher prep programs. So how do we teach the teachers of the future? So one of the analogies is, you know, we are the treasure state, and data is gold, and it should be gold, how we govern it, and how we hold it within the agency, as well as when we give it for these wonderful research projects. But it does begin with you. So how we mine that data is extremely important. And as I said, this is a second annual use uh, data conference, and we're hoping for many more. But what you glean and gain from this is going to help set the stage for that third conference. So when they reach back out to you and say, what did you learn, what did you didn't learn, what did you want to learn, that's more important because that's going to help prepare the future for how we do use data. Um, what I'd like to do then is, I'm a little bit longer, pretty, I'm pretty much short, but I'd like to have our honored guest and uh, visit with him about what his work has done. So, uh, I would like to say uh, Dr. Kyle Peck has a long history of working with education data and making sense of it. He is the co-director of the Center on Online Innovation and Learning and the Professor of Education and Research Fellow in the Learning Design and Technology Program at Penn State University. We're very honored to have someone from Eastern Montana <laughs> coming to Helm, the capital city. His well-respected blog, Evolution, is a window into his thoughts on topics as wide-ranging as massive open online courses 
and digital badges in education. Dr. Peck Pot Middle School. Give a shout out to that. <laughs> for seven years, and I'm sure each one of those were lucky seven, and did corporate training for five years. He's a co-author of two books, a contributor to countless journals and publication and education-related software programs. Dr. Peck will be with us over the next two days. He will also have a breakout session tomorrow morning. Please plan to attend if you'd like further conversation with him. So we need to give that Montana welcome out to Dr. Peck. Dr. Peck, please. to change the title of my session. <laughs> I'm going to unplug it and put it all back in. All right, I don't know if we have any. That should work. This is part of my strategy to look, <coughs> look human. I, don't know I forget who it was, but some Nobel laureate or something purposefully fumbled his cue card, his index cards on the way up to the stage. In fact, they, um, he was even going to use it. We just did that to become human. Uh, I'm from out of state, so you consider me an expert, but I, I am one of you. Uh, former middle school teacher, as mentioned, I have that twisted chromosome that lets me understand, appreciate, and work with uh, middle school kids, and that has served me well uh, throughout life. I mentioned wanting to change the title. That's because you did such a good job of saying, uh, I say data, she says data. Potato? I have a potato. Okay, so see, we're not all that different. Anyway, the, the, the real God is in giving it back, right? And also she mentioned self-confidence and the whole person and so many other affective factors that the idea is, you know, I wish I could change this and say needles. Oh, that's yeah. not right, is it? Yeah, it does. Well, that's interesting. We probably should do something about that. Let me end the show and start it again. He says, a bit of trepidation. <laughs> and now we're all looking out as not a non black Tell us where you found your sister walking to the barn. Oh. No, I, I'm good. I'm good. I yeah. 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 good. I do have a story about my sister walking to the park. Thank you, Michelle. Just your presence, just your just, just your proximity. <laughs> That's a panic. That's great. By the way, this is a great time for me to thank the Office of Public Instruction. We did a great job of helping me uh, think about this conference and choose a topic. We, were, we had a couple of different discussions, followed by I met with Robin for uh, about once a week for the past few weeks to really make this appropriate. I really appreciate it. And I haven't seen that kind of attention from an organizing group before, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> so my sister walks into a bar, <laughs> and uh, the guy next to her says, what do you do? And she says, oh, I'm a professor of statistics. And he said, oh, really? I've been wanting to ask you a question. Is it 6 and 7 is 14, or 6 and 7 are 14? What do you think? All right, the answer was, I thought you would know something about math. Six and seven is 13. But, okay, so that's the story. I was all right, I got, I got one more. I think we'll work a little bit. So, so my point with the changing the title and all that hubbub, now that I'm very human, is that my title should be How to Move the Needles. There are a lot of things. Howard Gardner, in his multiple intelligence theory, said it's not about how smart you are, it's about how you are smart. But all of us are smart in a lot of different ways. Well, the same thing is true about the use of data. It's not about, you know, how, you know, it's not about how much data you use or about using it. It's about how the different ways that you can use data, the different ways we can help people grow. So I would change this now to needles. And everywhere you see needle in here, I want you to think needles, because there are lots of things we should be monitoring. And sometimes 
data can help us move even those needles that aren't data related. So even things like confidence, where does confidence come from? It comes from success, from knowing success, from seeing a goal, from working hard to get there, from knowing you got there, and from having that conversation with teachers who care about you. Right, so it's, what my talk is gonna be about the sort of the central role in data in moving people forward and creating that relationship between teachers and students that makes a difference. So I wanna, uh, I guess I skipped the slide that said thank you. Let's go back to that, I can't skip all those slides. Here we go. We're moving on to this slide. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Needles. <laughs> Any data nerds in the house? <laughs> There's a few reluctant, yeah, some but not all. I kind of thought it was going to be that way. Uh, few people enter the field of education because they're in love with data, right? They do become economists, other things that, that are very important. Uh, and I thought of you guys when I saw this on the internets. Let's play school. I'll be a teacher. I don't want to be a student. I don't want to be a student. I don't want to be a student. No, we don't, that's not why we do it. It's not about the data, that's not why we come to education. Uh, but it's really important and I'm glad that uh, we have this opportunity. So then, as we were talking together about what we might make this conversation about, I came across this book by John Hattie, who's a professor of education from Auckland, University of Auckland in New Zealand. I hadn't heard of him. I've been in this, as you said, a long career, which means I'm old. I've been in this field for a long time, but I hadn't bumped into John Hattie's work. But it's a significant piece of work. This man has synthesized over 800 meta-analyses relating to achievement. In other words, he looked at in a very big way, big systematic way, what is it that moves the needle on student achievement? So he's, I use that word meta-analysis, just a quick review. I know some of you are data people. Most of you may know more about meta-analysis than I do, so I'm gonna fly through this and don't ask me any detailed questions. Uh, so Gene Glass, who I did uh, have the fortune of meeting when I was in Colorado, he was teaching, and this is about when meta-analyses began. He said the term's a bit grand, but it is about an analysis of analyses. In other words, what meta-analysis is about is combining the results of several studies. And then, it's, uh, it's also been described in Wikipedia by a statistical analysis that combines the results of multiple scientific studies. So what happened is he went through and looked at 50,000 studies that were combining the results of, of other studies about student achievement. And Michael Fullan, who I respect, a great leader of educational reform, uh, who understands the complexities of changing schools, called this the definitive book on sorting out the effectiveness of teaching strategies. Must read, right? And uh, John Hattie has used these results to sort of synthesize and create uh, a program uh, that teachers and school leaders can use to really understand what matters. So in a meta-analysis, you, you identify all the studies about achievement in X, you throw out the bad ones, you take the good ones and you create an effect size for each study. In other words, how much change did this study say it made? How much change did this study say it made? And to do that, you need a common measure. You need an effect size, which means, and there are lots of different ways to calculate it, but in general, you just subtract two means. You have a control group mean and an intervention mean. And you subtract those two means. How much difference is there between those means? And how does that compare to the standard deviation of the distribution of scores? So that gives you a way to know, no matter what the study, how big a difference did it make? Cool. I know I'm going fast here for multiple reasons. But an effect size of one, when it comes down to it, if you move the needle, if you make a difference of one standard deviation, that's pretty much the equivalent of advancing student achievement by two or three years. Or improving the rate of learning by 50%. Or correlation between a variable that you're working on and the achievement variable of about 0.5. So in other words, an effect size is a way we can sort of make sense of all these different studies and compare them and combine them. So he did that with 50,000 meta-analyses on a whole bunch of different topics, and he's ready to tell us what it is that helps us move the deal. So first, his first conclusion was, do educational innovations work? And the answer is yes. About 95% of studies that try to make a difference make a difference. 
That's not always a statistically significant difference. It's not always a bit. In fact, I, I directed the regional education lab for a while, and uh, it was it was depressing how study after study fails to find a significant difference between this treatment and that treatment when it's done. The studies are done really well. But it's not about did it work, because almost everything works. It's about what works best. Where should we put our energy? Where should we put our resources? Where should we really devote our time and thinking? And the answer turns out to be, no, that's just, I'm, I'll hold you out for a while. He used this to help us interpret that. He, he created this thing he calls the barometer of influences. <coughs> Sorry for the bad scan out of the book, but here it is. I tried to clean it up a little bit, and I just ended up blurring some of the letters, so I said it's good enough. All right, so this barometer of influences gives us a way to look at studies and say whether this is something we should pay attention to. So from about a 0.15 effect size to about 0.4, is what a teacher normally would do in an academic year. Teachers are different, content is different, but in general, the teacher working with the class for a year gets about uh, an effect in that range. And it would be a little different if there were no teacher. If people just get older, they get smarter, they learn stuff on their own, they get better at you know, performing, maybe even in the absence of instruction on something. So that's the range where you just expect them to get that much better as they get older. And then there are some things that actually do damage and, and go uh, take them downhill below what they would have done even if you'd left them alone. Not, not too many of those in education. And then there's this other big zone over here that he calls the zone of desired, desired effects, which is those that are 0.4 effect size and better. That's where he says you should invest your energy because that's where you're getting you know, the most out of your energy. Clear? Okay, good. I'm glad that went by in less than 10 minutes. That's good. <laughs> Okay, so what matters? Here we come down to it. So we're going to play a little, uh, a little guessing game here. So he clustered. I said he used 50,000 studies in a whole bunch of different topics. So we're going to look at first what he calls structural influences. And by the way, these are slides I grabbed out of a YouTube video, so they're not great. But uh, and by the end, I have a last slide in here. If you're welcome to my slides, and there it links out to all these things. This is his work, his slide. And he, he puts this up and asks an audience, so structural influences. We change the way school is organized. How much, how important would that be? Things like class size, things like charter schools, like diversity uh, of students, like summer school, welfare policies. Do we think those are gonna be, what range? Are those gonna be in that high range in the normal what? How do you think? Let's do this. Okay, so here's the strategy I just decided to implement. Talked to me by Don Anderson, who was my middle school principal when I taught middle school in Leadville, Colorado. So yes, I, I appreciate the rural mountainous uh, areas as well. Don Anderson said, ask a multiple choice question. I have everybody hold their hand up like this. And then when you say now, they have to show you their answer. So I'm gonna say, if you think it's high, you're gonna show one finger. If you think it's medium, you're going to show two, and if you think it's going to be low, you show three. All right, so structural influences in general. All hands up. It's a closed fist. Don't show fingers yet. Oh, you guys are good. Usually people are like, oh, this is a, yeah. So one, two, three, show. Okay, so we got ones and twos. Highs and middle, middles. We have a three over here. Okay, some threes. All right, notice the diversity. Some people go three like this. Some people go like this. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, answer. Survey says, no, that's actually on that low side, the 0.10-ish. So if you look at all those, some are higher than others, but basically they're in the 0.2-ish and down to even a negative one with welfare policies and things like that. Okay, so that's interesting. So move on. Next, next category, student attributes, the things about students. Now this is interesting, we can't change a lot of these things, but how important are these, how closely related are these things to student achievement when we take a scientific look at those things? One is high, two is medium, three is low. Ready? Thank you. Oh, up, 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 put that there, there you go, okay, ready? Show. Okay, one, two, a couple, threes. All right. Answer is also low. Okay, again. 
doesn't really bother us because we can't really do all that much about those anyway. But, but what that tells us is it's easy for us to say, well, they're, you know, high poverty. It's a high poverty neighborhood. It's not me. It's the students, or it's the parents, or it's the us, right? So this is, this is evidence that it's not those factors that make the most difference in what goes on in this. All right, so how about another category he calls deep programs. Now, in his work, he calls surface things like content knowledge, like memorization, knowing facts, that sort of thing. And he calls deep, like, understandings of things. So in here, he's got, like, some things that are really you know, aimed at developing the uh, metacognitive strategies and people's approaches to the way they operate. Okay? Ready? One, two, three, show. Okay, we still got some ones, twos, threes, okay. All right. Yeah, be careful with that one finger. Uh, so. All right. So, Middle school influence, exactly. So it turns out that so now we're getting a little better, but still not where we need to be, right? They're, they're, they're like the 0.16 average for those things. So yeah, so a lot of the things we focus on, it's not saying, he's not saying they're not worth doing. He's saying they're not worth counting on as your primary strategy, right? And these things in combination with other things, perhaps, and sometimes the cost of doing these things is so low that it still makes sense to do it. The cost of doing other things may be higher in terms of not just, I'm not talk, just talking dollars when I say cost. I'm talking about energy, professional development cost, the meeting time, and other things. Okay, so here's my field, technology and education, right? So computers in math, computers in science, computers in smaller groups, computers in. Ready? Show. Okay, I got twos and threes. Where'd my ones go with technology? All right, you're getting, you're getting test wise. Okay, so here's what happened with that. Okay, so it's higher than those other categories, but it's still not where we really want to be focusing, right? All right, so to summarize what he says, he's, he's another one of his slides. He says, you know, be careful that you don't fall for putting your energy into another distraction. That it's not about the home and parents, it's not about class size, it's not about accountability, it's not about the technology. Well, what is it about? Okay, another summary of his is most of what we try to do improvement doesn't improve achievement. This is a big part of the problem. It's not about whether, it's not about whether it works, it's about how well it works. And we need to focus on the things that matter. Okay, now, I think he had my attention at this point, right? Uh, I've seen that here, so that's really good. Okay, so, now for something not completely different, but a little different. Think about the best teacher in your life. Think about that great teacher, maybe the reason you went into an education-related field. And tell me what made that your favorite teacher? What made that teacher great? Just go ahead and shout some things out. They cared about me. They cared about me. Good. What else? They made learning fun. One-on-one relationship. One -on -one relationship. Yes. I'm seeing a lot of head nods out there. Anybody else want to add things to that? They made me feel successful and smart. They made me feel successful and smart. Yeah, they cared about me. Which takes me to two quick stories. Really quick stories. Almost as quick as that my sister went into a bar store. Okay. <laughs> one is a conversation I had with Mike Hannafin. He was a... a a great researcher in my field. He was my advisor at the University of Colorado before he moved to Penn State. We wrote the first book on computer-assisted instruction together, and I ended up following him to Penn State. After we were there for about a year, we were having sitting at the beginning of the school year, and one of us, I don't remember which one, I remember, I'll never forget the conversation, but I don't remember who said what. One said, I hope my son makes it through this school year without getting turned off for the whole process. The other one said, me too. And I don't remember which one said, What's going to make the difference? And the answer we came up with was relationship between the teacher and the kid. All those things you just said is what's going to make the difference. Quote, move the needle, right? Or keep the needle, and not break the needle, not break the meter. So, and then we said, the next question was, well, how much are we doing in the College of Education 
to prepare people to make strong relationships with kids? And the answer was, mm, I, I don't, I'm not, but, right? I don't know. We weren't really in teacher preparation directly, but we were associated with it. And that was an eye opener. And then, if this weren't a short story, I'd tell you about reading Horace's Compromise by Ted Sizer, where they talk about a high school teacher has you know, five to seven classes of 30 students each in 42 minute periods. And if they assign a two page paper, it's got 300 pages of student papers to correct. So they don't, they're teaching writing, but they can't assign writing. And the system's not set up to create those relationships. So it is now the exceptional teacher that creates those relationships. And those relationships are the things that really matter. Next, even shorter story, Winifred Belinsky. When I was, came to Penn State, I was into technology, I was reading electronic learning, and I found that the electronic learning teacher of the year was from Pennsylvania, so I went to visit her. She was doing amazing things. I went in her class, was divided into small groups, and each had a four by eight sheet of plywood, and they were developing a, an amusement park. Each group had a part of it, and it all had to come together. They were gonna slide all the pieces together in the, in the cafeteria on the culminating day, and a train was gonna move around the park and everything was gonna, right? And the kids had to figure all that out and make all the stuff and do all that. And it was great. And they were using technology and it was, it was amazing. And I asked her, I said, Winnie, you know, how did you get here? By the way, she had come from outside education and got interested in it a little later in career than most. And then her answer to me was, I tried stuff. And if it worked, I kept doing it if it didn't work, I stopped doing it. And I say, like, great answer, right. So, but how do we know, so to get back to our topic of the day, how do we know if what we're doing is working or not? Because a lot of stuff, those 95%, everything feels like it's working. And when we set out to make it work, in our interpretation, it works. And by the way, a lot of the reason it works is because if it really does work, we care enough about it to monitor, is it working? Oh, I better switch something here, is it, is it working? It's a constant iterative process between what's going on and what we're doing. Okay, so back to Hattie's findings. This is a slide he uses to, to summarize the things that really matter. This is, he's updated this a couple of times. This is one he did in about uh, 2013. He said, what matters is teachers working together as evaluators of their impact. Think about that for a minute. Teachers working together as evaluators of their impact. They're evaluating together. It's open. I'm saying they're saying, how, you know, help me, right? This is what I, this is what's happening with me. And they're talking together about a shared goal of moving things forward. I see you taking a picture, I'll be happy to give you a copy of the whole thing. I mean, so that's yeah, I don't think you're gonna be able to read that. I do that too. But you can do that, but uh, you can okay. So the second thing, so that's, that's important. How do you get that? Well, that's, that's what I would call a data culture, right? Teachers thinking together about progress, that's a data culture. That's what you guys are shooting for. That's noble. Number two, the power of moving from what students know toward explicit student success criteria. So first part of that, moving from what they know. You have to know what students know. Okay, so that's piece one. And that later on, when we look at individual factors, that's gonna be highly associated with effective teachers. They know what students know. And then moving from where they are to explicit understandings of what success looks like. And teachers often, these you know, very effective teachers often show students what the finished product looks like. Here are some good essays from last year. Here is a model that was created by here are the last year's science fair project winners. You know, that sort of thing. So, and having them understand what it takes to be successful. Errors in trust are welcome as opportunities to learn. Okay, which means two things. So it has to be okay to make a mistake. And, and this is the hard part, you kind of have to give them another chance and maybe another chance and another chance to get to success. And again, our system right now isn't really set up to make that easy. If you're moving with 30 kids, or 25, or 20, or even smaller classes, it's not really set up to allow them their own opportunities to get things and to understand and to get that kind of feedback. 
which is one of the reasons why I'm still a fan of technology in an environment like the one we're describing here. Maximize feedback to teachers about their impact. That's the first time I'm using that word impact, I think, maybe a second. That's, that's a key thing to understand, impact. What is it we're trying to do? In your remarks, thank you, you talked about you know, moving kids in a, in a hole and motivation. Use the word passion and use other words that are really not about you know, scores on tests. I'm, I'm a fan of scores on tests. Necessary but not sufficient in understanding impact. Because our impact isn't just about scores on tests, it's about creating that whole person who's confident and work ready and team player and you know, has self-efficacy. Says, well, I don't know that yet, but we can we can figure that out. You know, that kind of person is what we're trying to do. Uh, and getting the proportions of surface to deep correct. I mentioned surface is about facts and little things that are often tested, and deep is about the real understanding of how to use that. So if you get that balance correct, that's important. And then he says the Goldilocks principle, which is not too challenging, not too boring, just right. So zone of proximal development, you know, give them a challenge that they can handle, and gamers and other people will tell you, yeah, of course. Okay, so then in 16, they updated it, and he identified six super factors, which are the teacher's estimates of achievement. In other words, if teachers know what students know, if they can tell you, oh yeah, and they can describe well what students are capable of, that's highly related, 1.62, effect sizes. Those people who really have a good handle on that, they are moving the needle. Collective teacher efficacy, which is a school where everybody's talking about impact together and everybody has good information about that. Highly related. Self-reported grades. This is about students being able to tell you how they're doing and what they know. Just in terms of grades, because that's what people study, but it doesn't, it, it's a lot deeper than that. And, and when Hattie talks about this, he sort of dismisses it, or, or the person I was reading about his description of this, sort of dismisses and says, well, we can't really affect that. Well, no, no, you do affect that. If you have that conversation with students as an ongoing basis that says, here's what you're supposed to be doing, here's how you did, let's do this, da da da, da. students develop an understanding of who they are, and what they know, and what they can do. So, Saying we can we don't really affect that, I, I don't I don't believe that. Piagetian levels again. I, I'm more willing to say no. We can't really affect that. That's you know how uh, how they move through these different Piagetian levels, and we don't have time to get into that. But you know the, the more developed they, their thinking is, their metacognitive strategies, the more advanced they are, and all that sort of thing, the better they're going to achieve. And then conceptual change programs, which are things programs that aim at those deeper level kinds of structures. And then re response to intervention. So those studies are about, well, response to intervention is about identifying weaknesses, creating a plan to meet those weaknesses, and measuring whether that happens. So those are all the super effect size uh, factors. If, if you get to this slide, if you can download my slides and click there, it'll take you out to a website um, that will show you a list of, I don't know, 150, 200 factors ranked in order of the, their effect sizes. So there's a lot more behind that, but I'm going to just stop there and say, these are the ones I see that are directly related to the use of data, right? Teacher estimate of achievement, collective teacher efficacy, self-reported grades, response to intervention. To me, that's what a data culture, I'm going to expand data culture. You need a data culture as a foundation to create what I see him creating here is a, uh, an impact culture. And he calls his, that book and his process Visible Learning. All right, so I'm going to go back and mention that title of that book and say Visible Learning, learning that can be seen by students and by teachers and by parents and by And that changes, it's being able to see that learning gives that, creates that confidence that you were talking about and creates that understanding that I have a place in the world and I can make things happen. So this is probably too small to read. But again, this is his uh, set of high-level principles in categories. These are the things that he uh, figured. This is a figure from his book <coughs> that 
summarizes what it is we should be shooting for as we create this culture in schools. And the ones here in green are ones I see as directly related to this uh, data culture strategy. And then he called that figure, know thy impact. And I almost didn't notice that until I went to like refer to it in a little footnote. What was that figure two? Know thy impact. And I thought, whoa, that is the message. Know thy impact. And using the word thy is really bizarre, but is it? Because thy, it makes it sound like this is an exalted, this is like you. If you're in charge of a, of a student learning, that's an incredibly responsible, high, lofty position, right? So maybe thy was something he gave more thought to than I did at first. But impact, you know, hey, are you making a difference? Back to Ray Belinsky, if not, stop doing those things and start doing other things. If you are, keep doing those things and. Right? So what it comes down to is great teaching is about great teaching and learning relationships. Okay, great teaching and learning relationships are based on clear expectations, frequent high quality assessments, feedback, reflection, goal setting and motivation to achieve. Am I talking about students or teachers there? Both, right? So great teaching and learning relationships are based on the student and the teacher working for these things. So how do we develop these things in teachers? Well, through a data use culture as GEMS and, and the Office of Public Instruction is working so hard to make available, <laughs> gathering that data from the grassroots and giving it back in usable ways. That's huge, that's a big step in that. Through conscious effort at the school level to concentrate on teacher impact. Now with that, things have gone so well, I'm gonna take a technological risk and try and pop up a, a video here. Actually, I won't take quite as big a risk. I think I have it out here. I'll queue that, but let's see if it will fire up here. One minute. So the effect that now is the teachers, all the teachers. It's the teachers who work together. I'll say it again. Teachers who work together, collectively, collaboratively, to understand their impact. And that's probably the biggest single most factor in this business that teachers and principals and systems that go into classrooms, that go into schools, that go into to, to, to systems, who say my job is to understand my impact are the ones that have the biggest effect. <laughs> Not the teachers who say my job is to cover the curriculum, my job is to get kids through the exams. It's teachers who say I want to understand my impact. Now, it begs the moral purpose question. What is impact? But that's a really critical question. And it's not just scores on tests. One of the things that I think is critical is how do we get kids to reinvest in this business called learning? Do they want to do more of it? And certainly if you look at the... Took a risk. What I should have done, I think, was quit PowerPoint first and stop sharing that screen. And then it might have worked better. Okay. But... He makes the point very well, and uh, uses gestures and really hammers it home, but that's that. Okay, so moving on. The purpose of this conference then, making effective use of data to move the needle, or now needles. So I thought with uh, some members of the Department of Public Instruction about, well, what can we do? What, what, what might I demonstrate as a way to use gems? And in the next couple of minutes that I have to do this, um, I'm going to sort of show you some ways you might be able to do this, show you one way. So you could use GEMS to monitor a single school's progress over time. That's pretty easy, but you have that data already anyway. You can try to understand the performance of schools taking demographic considerations into account, which is a process that some people would call benchmarking. Right, so this is, a, this is what I often hear. So I, I work with a, 
a school in uh, inner city Philadelphia called the Shepherd School. And they were a good school, and they cared about their kids, and they were doing lots of things right. But one thing we would often hear is, we're doing pretty well for a school like ours. Right? Doing pretty well for a school like ours. And that is, in a way, putting off a lot of responsibility on that set of student characteristics that Hattie shows really didn't make a difference. So even before seeing Hattie's work, I wanted to, I wanted, and others wanted to be able to say, well, is that true? Are we doing well for a school like ours? So what if we found schools like ours and then compared our performance to their performance now and then over time? So use those as benchmarking schools to see what's happening. Can we move the needle? Can we advance student achievement more than other schools that are like ours? That seems like a good way to use GEMS data and to, to sort of feed that impact culture to create a, a school that's constantly using that feedback to improve itself. And then to identify students at risk and propose interventions to turn things around. So in the end, it's about individual relationships and individual knowledge of students. And GEMS can help you there uh, with some of the dashboards they've created. But what we decided to do was to look at this one, understanding the benchmarking one. So with that, I'm going to jump into a little demo of uh, what I might do. So this is the, my goal is the benchmarking goal. So the steps I would take would be this. I would create a data file containing the achievement data of interest. So I'm going to say, I'm a former middle school teacher. I'm going to go with middle school. I'm going to go with seventh grade. I'm going to go with math. So how are we doing in seventh grade math compared to other schools like us? So I'd first start by generating a data file containing the achievement data of interest. Then I would sort that data file to find schools with similar performance. In other words, what other schools are doing about as well as I am. By the way, you could do this another way too. You could say, who are the schools like me? And then you could find the performance of other schools. But the way GEMS is set up right now, it's easier to go ahead and say, who are the schools that are performing in a comparable way? And which of those have characteristics like me and set up a benchmarking set. So that's what I'm doing here. So sort and find schools that are performing in a similar manner. Then use what you know about demographics. You can say, OK, well, mine's an inner city school. These two are also inner city schools. Let me take that list and go check the demographic characteristics and find the ones that match most closely with the variables that I care about. Or I'm a rural school. I want to find other rural schools. The problem with that is that because rural schools are often so small, the data for individual classes isn't really uh, available publicly. And I don't know if, you, if that can be requested or, or what. So uh, we're going to use an example of larger schools to, to figure that out. Hmm? Yeah. <coughs> Great. So another thing I love about the way you've got it set up is a, a link on the upper right that says make a data request. And you can say, I'd like a data file that has this in it. So it's good to know. OK, so then you can use the GEM side-by-side -side comparison, school comparisons, to find out whether those schools are, the, which of those schools that you've identified as possible would be closest to yours and demographic factors. Then you have to develop an action plan to try and move the needle. Right? What are we going to do to improve math scores? And then implement that process. And then each year, come back and compare your progress against those that, of the schools you are benchmarking with. So with that said, Another risky thing, but first I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can jump out and show you other things. Okay, good. So if I jump into here, I'm going to close. That's what Hattie looks like. That's the video I should have shown you this way before. My apologies. So the first thing had to do with getting data from GEMS on seventh grade student math performance. So here I am. I took the liberty of well, I can do it again. So data, we go to data, to student achievement. Once we're in student achievement, we go over here to this, I call that a hamburger menu, right? <laughs> Somebody did that, I, I never knew what to call it, but it's a hamburger, right? So you go to the hamburger menu, come over here to uh, statewide assessment. Statewide assessment opens up to Smarter Balance. That's the most recent data on that. So I choose Smarter Balance Assessment Proficiency Levels. That takes me to this dashboard. So in this dashboard, I say, yep, that's the year I want. Yep, I want all races. You can, yep, yep, this is grade seven. I want grade seven. I have to select the value first. 
I do that every time. A slow learner. And so I'm going to select a value. The value here is state. I want all the schools in the state. So I say state, and it's going to give me, you know what it gave me? No, it's about to give me. Oh, view report. It loads and will give me a list of all the schools with seventh grade in them for the uh, state in alphabetical order. Oh, well, other than that, <laughs> what, what did that happen? Okay. So I state, and then I go, thank you, then I go seventh grade, and then I go math. There you go. See, I'm just proving you can, see, this is one of those, one of those, yeah, I should what, you report before I start extrapolating. Thank you. This is one of those examples of, of error and trial free, error free, errors being accepted in the learning environment and so on. So we have one that works. You're in Montana. That's right. So here's what we get. We get a list of all schools with seventh grade. It doesn't look like all because it ends in B, but then if you look up here, it says page one through two question mark, which I've been told. I thought that meant two, but it means 20 something pages, I guess. So that means if I were to page through this, there'd be more data there. That's not what I want to do, right? By the way, this is the, the district name or the uh, local education agency, and this is the school name itself. So this data file has a bunch of blank rows because if, if there were multiple schools, they would roll up into the district score. So I want to use that. So there's a little gizmo right here that looks like a diskette. So those of you who remember diskettes, right? Anybody? No, just me. They used to be. They used to even be floppy. They used to be flexible. I remember some for video discs that were this big. But anyway, it's a, they used for some reason because I guess other things don't look like a storage device. That's where you're, you're taking it down. You're going to download. So that's the icon for that. So you go there and you can choose how to bring it down. If you choose Excel, it brings you down a spreadsheet with this data in it. However, if you want to do what I want to do, that's not very useful because, I mean, that's not the one I want. I'll show you. I'm going to, uh, this is the output of the Excel one. So it has this header information and a nice graphic here. It looks good, and all the data is there. If you want to scroll through or find the school and everything, that's a good way to do it. But if I want to use that to, this, like these three, columns here, like this, uh, you know, if I click on this, or this one, some of these have multiple, multiple columns. Anyway, so this, yeah. Trust me, if you get that into Excel, and uh, it says, and you try and sort, it says I can't sort because they're not all formatted the same way, and blah, 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 blah. So do that if that's what you want, but I think you want this. I think you want to say, when you're back over here, I think you want to say CSV for comma separated values. And when I did that, it gives me this file. And it actually took it into Excel for me. Uh, I don't know why, I guess because I'd set the parameters right before. But what you normally get is a text document that would show up like this. He says, expecting to see that. Okay? So this is what it looks like. And what happens is if you have been in Excel, and the last, I think it may default to the last thing you did, which is why it automatically formatted it for me. It thinks, it's going to think this is um, tab separated or delimited. It's a certain number of spaces. When you go to the pop up a wizard to help you move the data, and it thinks that, that it's a fixed field length because it sees all these things lining up without tabs. So it guesses wrong. So you have to go through and say that it's a, a comma separated value. And when you do, you get a nicer looking window that looks like this. Okay, and you see it's not still not formatted as, as I would like it. This is over here in the states up here. And for some reason the state, this number count is off, these things are off by a column. But it gives you a, a data file you can work with. So what you want to do next is you want to create a file like this where you do some formatting. You change the column widths. You take the state numbers and you move them down. You insert a row and you insert the state as if it were a school. And now you've got something that's pretty good. 
<laughs> well, that's, that's, that's good, yeah. It reminds me of my ring side. I used to have uh, Andy Rayberry uh, ring time for people. I don't know. Okay, anyway, that's not very kind. Anyway, yeah, here we go. So, uh, Jeff, you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, that's not very kind. Anyway, here we go. So, this is the next step, but that's not enough. And I still have all these blank rows for like the districts here. Uh, a lot of them don't have, I don't really want to compare to districts, and a lot of them don't have much data anyway. So I want to get districts out of there. So the next iteration, I would create this file. And I also, I not only um, got rid of the, I guess I got rid of the districts in the last one. But so now I wanted to, I think I missed one. State patterns of school. Okay, I guess I can. And then, all right, we're going with this one. So, the next stage is I decided I probably wanted to look not just at, if I look at per percent proficient, well, that's only one slice and it's not both. So, a lot of people want to do calculations based on this proficient and advanced combined. And these are the people who are good and better. And these are the people who aren't. So, I created that, created those columns with calculations. Then you can sort it based on the highest levels at the top. So here I'm looking now at, this is a list of all the schools with seven grades that, have, that are sorted by the best performers based on that, uh, this particular test. Then I can find my school and others to compare it to. So I don't have a school, but I went, I assume, I pretended I did it. And so I went to this stage where I said, okay, let's suppose I'm Helena Elementary, and then Helena will pretend to be this C.R. Anderson Middle School, which is a pretty, you know, high-performing um, school. It's got right about 50%, another reason why I chose that school. It's kind of about half the students are on this side, half on this side, so, okay. And then I said, well, what will I I'll consider as my matches? Anybody 5% above and 5% below? So that's these, these light green columns are all the school districts that were within 5% of 49.9. And then I said, okay, so let's look through there and see which ones might be the best matches using just my own understanding of who's out there. Like if I know I'm a rural school, I might choose other rural schools, although we mentioned there's an issue this day, you wouldn't be able to do it. But if I know I'm an inner city school, or I know I'm a large school, or I know I am X, so I looked at these, and I, the thing I saw was these are big schools and small schools. And the one of mine was a relatively big school. My proficient count, my proficient and advanced count was 151. So I said, wow, some of these are like 36. So they're still high percent, but those must be really small schools, probably not a lot like mine. So I said, let's go with the ones that have, you know, the higher number of students, the larger schools. They're probably from cities like my city and so on. So I decided, okay, so these are potential schools that I might want to compare myself to. And it turns out the large one, there was another one in uh, in Helena, and then Kalispell, uh, and Bozeman, and Missoula, Chief Joseph Washington, and uh, in Billings. I also knew there'd be people from a lot of those cities in here, so I thought, yeah, I'm not sure what's that So then, I, then what you would do is you'd say, all right, let's, so let's investigate those schools. So I took those schools, and now I wanted to figure out this kind of demographic information, which takes us back to GEMS, to the side-by-side -side comparison. Little known fact, you can compare more than three schools. Uh, sometimes it gets a little ugly, but, but not always. So it just lets you add schools you want to compare, and then you can bring out a data file. So, <coughs> so this is what I got when I compared those schools in school district characteristics. I can also look at the uh, CRT assessment statistics and uh, program and course offerings, and there's no real financial information for public schools out there yet. But this is the kind of stuff I wanted to look at. So do they have about the same number of economically disadvantaged students as I do? Do they have about the same number of special ed students as I do? And so I get this, uh, and I, I just was able to copy these and paste them into the spreadsheet. Works most of the time, just pasting them as multiple columns, sometimes not, don't know why. But I decided, well, it's not hard for me to fix these schools and just put them in one at a time. I ended up with this. So here I have my, my six 
comparable schools, schools I'd like to compare, economically disadvantaged student-teacher ratio, I thought was important, and special education percentage. So I look at those and I go, yeah. So C.R. Anderson's a little higher in uh, both student-teacher ratio and a little higher than some, well, not all, right? So this economically disadvantaged percentage. So you can look at these and say, maybe you want to say, I'm more like these two, and just use two, maybe you say these are okay. But this is your, again, theoretically, and not theoretically, hopefully, it would be your school a group of you who are going to do this benchmarking, thinking about this together. Say, who are, who do we consider to be our comparable schools? Who do we want to benchmark against? And then you have your first year already in this spreadsheet. So you can say, well, how are we doing right now? And you can see, well, these three are above me. These two are below me. Okay, onward. Now, what are we going to do to improve math scores? And next year, hopefully, you're, you're rising through the, those ranks and, and through the entire ranks as well. Any questions or comments or thoughts? So, um, back to this. So this is what we just did. We did that, I now have a comparison group. I'm ready to be my data culture and uh, to move ahead. So, in closing, <coughs> data, 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 can help you help students. Data is your friend. No matter what role you're in, data is your friend. It can help you. And you can move the needles. Next time, if I do this again, it'll have multiple, multiple needles on there. You can have impact. That's what you should be looking for. Impact. Is what I'm doing making a difference? Am I having impact? And impact goes way beyond the things that are tested. So you need to be asking yourself questions about qualitative data as well. How do students feel? Do I see evidence that they're more engaged than they were in the past? Am I going to be their favorite teacher or their one teacher when they're asked to remember that one teacher? Different things. But this reflection on multiple factors is what creates not only a data culture, but an impact culture. And with that, I will stop and we have about eight minutes for questions, I believe. of the test, test, act, test to the students. You show that you know they do the test and then the kids don't get any results for a long time so they know what kind of impact does that have. Yeah, yeah so the, the, the results, it needs to be a constant progress, a constant process of attempt, assessment, feedback. Attempt assessment feedback, attempt assessment feedback. And I have a slide in another presentation that is this confidence cycle, right? We try it. So feedback has to be immediate, relatively immediate, which is one of the reasons why I'm a fan of computer-based assessments and computer-based contributions. Because ideally they're trying things and getting impact, getting an understanding of their progress instantly. But you're right, it's not just about that one year snapshot. That's a good way to compare yourself to other schools. So you don't want to constantly be, be comparing yourself to others outside, but you do want to have that constant flow of information. So the conversations between teachers and students are what build that relationship. And those conversations have to be a lot more frequent. And you made a very good point. So, so that can be based on you know, classroom-based quiz data on just sitting down and have, working the problem with the student. And all kinds of different sources for that feedback. You don't seem, you don't look at all that well, sort of stuff. It, it's this uh, assessment. They don't get any uh, feedback right away. So, you know, at that point, they, they feel this test does not really matter for them. 
as much. Yeah, so that's, that's a really important point. So the, the, the test that becomes data here is something they don't really have much confidence in. That, to me, that's kind of a different question, but really important. If they don't take that seriously, then our benchmarking is based on weird information or non-information. So that's critical too. The best way to get them to do that, it's not contrary to practice, giving them a candy bar on test day and, and boning up for it. It's having that relationship with them, creating a student that cares about his or her progress and cares about your success as a teacher too and understand what that test is for. So they need to understand that there are formative assessments that happen all the time. And then there's this one summative assessment that may not do you that much good as a student, but it's going to do the school good, it's going to do us good, and it's going to prove to me just how much progress you made in an entire long period of time. So we have to sell that, and selling that is best with a relationship in the bank. Thank you. Questions? Boy, you guys are not good. <laughs> Corrections? Additions? All right, I guess we're done uh, four minutes and 48 seconds early. Thank you very much.